Hi everyone, this is Marley here with Duke Schnauzers and this video is going to be a long one. I apologize, there honestly was no way around it, but please know I appreciate each and every single one of you who listens to this till the end and I promise it's important, especially for you breeders out there. So this topic is long overdue and I know I'm gonna ruffle some feathers by posting this, but all of what I am about to say is backed by history, science, and I have references. In fact, I was heavily tempted to include a bibliography at the end of this video. I still might. So today I'm going to talk briefly about the history of the miniature schnauzer breed, how it was developed, where we are now, DNA testing pitfalls, how it may negatively impact breeding practices, and the coefficient of inbreeding. So now for some background on my most favorite breed ever, and maybe yours too. In the late 1500s, Dr. John Caius wrote the first ever study on British dogs titled Decannabis Britannix. And no, that did not refer to a green plant that was smoked. It was translated into English in 1576 entitled Of English Dogs, The Diversities, The Names, The Natures, and The Properties, A Short Treatise. In this work, he attempted to begin grouping breeds by function, which was pretty much the case for how dogs were classified until the 19th century. In the 19th century, we began keeping some records of bloodlines and started classifying dogs by breed rather than function. It was then that breed types began to be standardized and unified. However, it was an ever evolving process with a lot of changes and bumps along the way. The first miniature schnauzer was registered in 1899, which is around the time when dogs were first beginning to be categorized into these specific breeds that I talked about. They were farm dogs bred down from standard schnauzers to be ratters, and they are good at catching vermin. While we cannot be certain of the origin, it is widely believed and accepted that they were bred from standard schnauzers to affin pinchers and poodles. Miniature schnauzers were ever evolving by name, if not by nature. In 1935, the Kennel Club changed the miniature schnauzer name to the Affen Schnauzer, but this change didn't last long. The German Kennel Club was up in arms about the name and went back to the miniature schnauzer the following year. The American Kennel Club first registered miniature schnauzers as wire-haired miniature pinchers until 1926 when they were given the breed name we use and love today. Now, where are we today? We have this fabulous breed that originated from crossing a standard schnauzer with other breeds like the Alphen Pincher or the Poodle. Ta-da, no, that's not it. Many schnauzers are found in standard colors like black, black and silver, or salt and pepper. They are also bred in my personal favorite, the non-standard color variety, like white, red, liver, sable, rust, black and red, liver and tan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Some may argue that these non-standard colors like I breed, that they're new and that non-standard color breeders are ruining the breed. With the background I just gave you, we already know miniature schnauzers originated from being bred to poodles, maybe even liver or red colored poodles. So they could have been around since the creation of the breed. Most likely these colors were there from the beginning guys. The only reason we have a defined color palette for this breed is because of the Miniature Schnauzer Club of America. After the breed's acceptance into the AKC, the MSCA decided which colors were deemed standard versus non-standard or alternate. What that means is that both classifications are considered schnauzers by the Miniature Schnauzer Club of America and the American Kennel Club. It also means that both non-standard and standard colored miniature schnauzers can compete in all AKC events except for those pertaining to composition. So to put an end to the age old dig from standard colored breeders to breeders like me, my dogs are just as much schnauzer as yours and in fact, they might be healthier. Let me tell you why. Whenever a breeder breeds, the focus should largely be on bettering the breed. The easiest way to do that in my mind is to breed a dog with an attractive composition, temperament, and the right genetics coupled with stellar health testing results. Enter to the scene Embark DNA and the Wisdom DNA panel. Now I've only used Embark, so for the purposes of speaking about what I know, I will only address Embark's tests here. Embark was founded in 2015, and even though this testing service is widely used by breeders and pet families, truly the technology is still in its infancy. It's changing a lot. This testing can be a useful tool, but it's not the only tool that should be considered when pairing a dame and a sire. I love Embark for its health screenings, 
the ability to test for red variants, and most importantly, it tells me how high a dog's COI or coefficient of inbreeding is. A COI result basically tells you how inbred your dog is compared to the general population of your breed and even other breeds. We should always be striving to have a lower COI result, which can be accomplished by increasing our breeding population or genetic diversity of the dogs that we're breeding. Now, Embark isn't perfect, they'll tell you that themselves, and testing capabilities are constantly being expanded. Thus, future results on a puppy that came from, let's say, a parent born two years ago who was tested may come back with a surprising result not found on their parents' results. Now, here's the meat and potatoes of my video. Puppies that are being born to two parents who tested at 100% miniature schnauzer previously are now coming back with results that show them with a very small percentage of unresolved or poodle. Now, before you come for me, listen, just listen, as to why this is a good thing for our breed. Do you remember how the breed originated? Standard schnauzers were bred, most likely, to poodles and affin pinchers. They were crossed. Now, I'm certainly not saying that many schnauzer breeders with results like this are defrauding buyers and breeding pure poodles back into their line. That would be a schnoodle. Here's why. Now, according to Embark's own blog post, quote, when Embark conducts a DNA test on a purebred dog, they use a proven scientific approach to assess the genetic makeup of the dog using a process involving reference panels. For various reasons, the registered purebred dog tested by Embark may not perfectly match the genetic signature of the reference panel. One example is the dog may have an ancestor that is in a closely related breed, which was utilized prior to the closing of the breed stud book many generations ago. Another reason is that the dog may come from a bloodline that is geographically very different from the group of reference panel dogs. These results in no way affect the purebred status of the dog or its standing with the registry, like the AKC. In fact, because these dogs usually contain genetic signatures not common in the breed, they can be highly useful for maintaining or even increasing genetic diversity in the breed." End quote. Did you guys get all that? So basically, this is a good thing for our breed or any breed, and it doesn't impact a dog's purebred status or AKC registrability. These dogs are still considered miniature schnauzers. Remember when I said breeders should ultimately be working to better the breed and how lowering COI was part of it? We know that the more inbred a dog is, the more health problems they can have. This is exactly what happened to my second favorite breed, the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. The breeding pool became so small, the breed was essentially ruined. Overseas, there are actual regulations that prohibit breeders from breeding these dogs at all because they are so incredibly sickly. This is something I would never want to see happen to the miniature schnauzers that we all love. I can speak from personal experience and I have the results to back that lower COIs being associated with dogs whose Embark test results came back with a small percentage of poodle or unresolved. There are two dogs I have tested with results like this and their coefficients of inbreeding results were 18 to 19%. The average coefficient of inbreeding or COI among purebred dogs is generally cited as 20 to 25%. So these lower results are fabulous. My other dogs that tested at 100% miniature schnauzer have a COI in the 20s. In the non-standard colored world, we are seeing this most predominantly in dogs that are red or carry the red intensity that is so valuable. Some breeders turn their nose up to anything that doesn't test 100% mini schnauzer on Embark, but I really feel like those breeders are not considering all the facts. Plus, like I mentioned before, these fun colors probably came from poodles to begin with. We are only helping to keep the breed healthier by breeding a dog that tests with a partial percentage of poodle or unresolved to a dog that tests 100% miniature schnauzer. By increasing the breeding pool, COI results are going to go down. This logic is exactly the same as the notion to breed a dog that carries a single copy of a trait, like IVDD, for example, to a dog that does not have one. If we only breed dogs that have 100% clear results to other dogs that are 100% clear, we are bottlenecking the breed and our favorite breed will get sicker and their lifespans will get shorter. That's what I have for you guys, and I hope you found it useful. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me, and God bless y'all, and have a happy Christmas season. Hi everyone.